Uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, lecture. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge uh, the country. Uh, and it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Kenry from, he's a postdoctoral fellow in Marnie Blewett's lab in Molecular Medicine Division. Um, and his talk is Resetting the Epigenome for Pluripotency. A little bit of background of Andrew. He did his Bachelor of Science at University of Melbourne. Then he went to UK to do his PhD over there uh, with Professor Wolf Rick um, at University of Cambridge, um, where he investigated mechanisms by which imprinted non-coding RNA influence fetal growth. He returned to Melbourne in 2012 and joined Barney's group um, as a postdoc and studied epigenetic control of X chromosome inactivation. And now he's a senior research officer in her group and uses epigenomic approaches to study the epigenetic control of gene expression and pluripotency. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Well, morning, everyone. Uh, okay. I'm going to uh, give you a talk on uh, epigenetics um, and um, specifically how um, the epigenome gets reprogrammed for, uh, for pluripotency. Uh, so this was really a field um, uh, mostly for academ academic science, uh, almost purely for a long time. But uh, a few years ago, there was a major discovery, which I'll talk about later, which has really pushed this into the the very vanguard of uh, what's possible for medicine in the future. So I think it's quite uh, relevant to, uh, to WEHI for, for reasons I'll get into. Okay, so just to start off, uh, so um, we're all on the same page. Uh, the epigenome is, um, uh, is uh, commonly referred to as um, uh, a set of epigenetic alterations to DNA that control the way that uh, DNA functions. Uh, but that doesn't uh, alter the underlying DNA sequence. So these marks are mitotically heritable, um, uh, but are generally, uh, because they're not part of the DNA, not thought to be um, inheritable uh, um, through the generations. And so they regulate uh, gene function, specifically uh, organizing chromatin to make um, uh, repressed and active chromatin states. And so the type of uh, marks uh, I'm talking about are specifically uh, DNA methylation, which is a, a methyl, methyl group added to a cytosine molecule uh, of DNA. I'll be mostly talking about DNA methylation in the talk today, but other epigenetic marks include uh, modifications to the histone tails, uh, the way the uh, uh, nucleosomes are packaged uh, into... Uh, local chromatin environments and higher order chromatin environments. And we also include uh, non-coding, non sorry, I'm getting used to this, non-coding RNA-based uh, mechanisms as well as being epigenetic. But like I say, it'll mostly be DNA methylation today. Okay, this is a um, very famous uh, picture drawn by Conrad Waddington um, uh, to describe how a cell differentiates. And um, uh, the way he's likened this to is essentially a, uh, a marble rolling down a, a series of, um, uh, of gullies. And the marble is always rolling downhill, and it makes some uh, decisions at various points on its way to a, um, a final destination. And the key to this analogy is the fact that it makes the decisions, um, but it, it can't go backwards, can't roll uphill. And what he means by this is the marble is a pluripotency cell, gets to a fork in the, in the gutter, and um, uh, these would be the progenitor cells on their way to becoming committed cells, um, fully lineage-restricted cells. And what stops them from uh, being able to uh, roll, back up, roll back up the gutter is essentially epigenetic control. So from a pluripotent cell uh, to a committed cell, you get this progressive layering and, um, of epigenetic marks that become more complex and more stringent and more able to restrict the cell to its um, committed fate. Okay. So that uh, is true, but it um, so prevents, uh, presents a problem for, um, for development, I suppose, because life is a cycle. So essentially, you have to form a, a um, fully um, 
somatic uh, adult organism, but that organism obviously needs to uh, create the next generation. So from um, a somatic, uh, two somatic cells, the sperm and an egg, the, um, you need to be able to create a fully totipotent zygote. Um, and so what needs to happen for, uh, is between the, um, from there to there, the uh, epigenome needs to be completely uh, remodeled. And we call this epigenetic reprogramming or um, epigenetic erasure. And so this is a so, uh, a complete loss of, almost complete loss of DNA methylation as well as a remodeling of the histones. And that essentially erases the marks that were laid down by the previous generation in order to make a, uh, a clean slate for the next generation to develop from. So there's this wave of epigenetic reprogramming that occurs first in the pre-implantation embryo. And then there's actually a second wave of epigenetic reprogramming which occurs in the uh, primor primordial germ cells, so the cells that will uh, later give rise, rise to uh, adult germ cells. Um, and these uh, start to develop at about day 14 in a mouse from the, from the epiblast. So the epiblast is a, um, is, is, uh, a uh, differentiated cell type, and so that also needs to be reprogrammed in order to, um, to make the... Um, the germ cells. So there's two ways of reprogramming, one in the early uh, pre-implantation embryo and one in the primordial germ cells. Uh, and this is a very famous graph uh, that tells you what happens to DNA methylation during, during uh, the life cycle. So I'm um, plotted on the... What am I doing? Plotted on the... Axis here is DNA methylation, and so the, uh, the sperm and the egg are both fully methylated cell types. And then once the egg becomes fertilized, we get a, a very rapid drop in DNA methylation that's complete by the blastocyst stage. And then as the cells of the blastocyst de de develop into their embryo, we get a remethylation of, uh, of, the, of the differentiated cells. And then these are then maintained um, in the somatic uh, adult organism. Um, in all cells apart from the germ cells. So the primordial germ cells then undergo this up, the uh, rapid loss of DNA methylation, which is then re-established in the... Sorry. Uh, re-established in, um, in the gametes. Uh, okay. All right, so uh, there are these two waves of uh, epigenetic reprogramming, and we don't really understand an awful lot about um, how this happens, um, but uh, sort of the first hint that it was possible came in um, the late uh, 50s and early 60s by uh, this guy, John, John Gurdon, uh, working at Cambridge. Um, and it, this was the 50s, and um, well before we knew about epigenetics. And his question was... Um, does a somatic cell contain all the genes <clears throat> um, required for life, or does, does the somatic cell only retain genes required to be that particular somatic cell? And so to answer that question, he, uh, he working, working with frogs, uh, took somatic cells of a frog, uh, and then he sucked out the nucleus of the somatic cell of the frog, uh, and then he put it into an enucleated uh, a frog's egg. Uh, and then put that into um, a female frog, with the idea being that if that nucleus from the somatic cell had every gene required for life, then he'd be able to um, produce frogs this way. Um, and he did. He got heaps of frogs. It worked really well. And what I love about this experiment is that, <laughs> first, first of all, he proved his hypothesis, which was um, turned out to be incredibly naive, but he proved that, but what else he also, for this experiment to work, um, uh, he essentially uh, discovered epigenetics, and he essentially discovered that epigenetics could be reprogrammed. So these are two or three huge discoveries that allowed this experiment to work. And I think it's incredible, because I have Western bots fail. <laughs> uh, OK, all right, so what all, the other thing you can learn about this is that as for reprogramming, is that um, there's something about the, uh, the, the frog oocyte, the environment inside the frog oocyte that allows um, a, a somatic cell nucleus to reprogram. 
And so in that oocyte is something that we refer to as maternal effect genes. So obviously the, the oocyte has its own cytoplasm that comes packed with RNA and protein and um, our mitochondria as well. Um, and it's these, we call them maternal effect genes because uh, they're essentially the, the um, proteins and RNAs that the uh, very early zygote has to, has to work with. Um, because there is no transcription from the zygotic genome until about day two. So at day one, we have these maternal effect genes that are sitting inside the oocyte, um, and it's something in that maternal soup that is um, able to reprogram the genome. Right. And uh, for a long, long time, we had uh, really no idea what, what that might be specifically um, until... Uh, uh, 2006, there was a, 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 another really landmark um, paper. So John Gurdon, who did the frog experiment, and Shinya Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize uh, jointly a couple of years ago for these the two experiments. But Yamanaka's experiment was to try and work out what, what it factors it was that was able to reprogram uh, a somatic uh, uh, genome. Um, and what he did was to, to look at the proteins that were present uh, sorry, I should tell you. So, so it works if you put a nucleus inside an oocyte, like I said, but it also works if you put a nucleus inside an embryonic stem cell. And so what Yamanaka did was to look at factors that were common between an oocyte and an embryonic stem cell, assuming that they, these would be the proteins that were, were able to reprogram a somatic nucleus. And really quite remarkably he found four, so four in combination. So he had a list of about 30-odd, uh, and he tried them all in different combinations and found that he only needed four to, to, to reprogram a fibroblast into what he has called a, an induced pluripotent stem cell or an iPS cell, um, which is essentially like an embryonic stem cell. So the four are um, OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMIC. And actually, MIC is uh, dispensable for this, pro uh, for this process. But if you overexpress uh, these four genes in a fibroblast, it'll undergo complete epigenetic reprogramming back into a um, pluripotent stem cell. So uh, th that process is not perfect by any means, but um, there are a lot more factors. But what we do know is that the reprogramming is transcription factor driven, and that leads to a total uh, cascade of events that occur um, downstream of that. And this is what we're really trying to understand. But I just wanted to talk brief briefly about the mechanism of uh, DNA methylation erasure. So DNA methylation is a uh, covalently bound modification to the, um, to the cytosine, and it's, it's obviously very hard to remove a covalent um, bond. But it turns out there are two ways to, um, to remove it. There's, a, there's an active process that involves um, enzymes and a passive process that is more or less just dilution um, through cell divisions. And you can see the different kinetics here of... Uh, of the, uh, the paternal genome here versus the uh, maternal genome. And the paternal genome gets uh, reprogrammed uh, at the one cell stage very rapidly. Uh, and so this is active DNA methylation of the paternal genome. And then we have a much slower uh, demethylation of the maternal genome. Um, and this happens um, passively through cell division. So active DNA methylation is uh, active DNA demethylation is driven by the TET enzymes, and there was a lot of hundreds of scientists working on trying to identify what actively demethylated DNA, um, and it was only discovered at about 2010. Um, and it turns out that it's this TET family of enzymes. Um, they're hidden behind a pretty obscure name, the 1011 translocation um, set of enzymes. So they're called that because it's common, commonly mutated in cancer and forms a translocation with MLL. Um, but what they are are DNA oxidase enzymes, and they will um, oxidize uh, the um, methyl group on DNA. So here is an unmodified cytosine. There are DNA methyltransferases that add a methyl group to the cytosine, and we call this now a, a methyl cytosine base. 
and then the TET oxidizers uh, will act on this methyl group, oxidize it into a hydroxy methyl mark. This hydroxy methyl mark can then get further oxidized by the TETs to a formal um, a cytosine mark, and then to a carboxyl cytosine mark. And from a carboxyl, you can undergo a chemical reaction, decarboxyl decarboxylation reaction that um, essentially uh, removes the modification entirely, or you can remove this modification through the base excision repair pathway. So that's how active DNA methylation works. Um, and here's a picture of that in, um, in action. So this, you're looking here at, uh, at the one cell embryo. <clears throat> um, uh, and in red, we have DNA methylation. So up here is the um, polar body, uh, so ignore that. Here is the female pronucleus, and here is the male pronucleus. And you can see uh, in the one cell embryo, uh, just after fertilization, you have highly packaged DNA. And the DNA becomes... Um, well, expands um, and, and expands and expands. And what you can see is the female pronucleus maintains DNA methylation, whereas the male pro pronucleus loses DNA meth methylation without cell division. And this loss of uh, DNA methylation in the male pronucleus is accompanied by uh, an increase in hydroxymethylation. So that's the product of the TET enzymes. And you're getting a replacement of the DNA methylation uh, with hydroxymethylation, which is then removed by uh, base excision repair. Okay, so that's active DNA methylation. Passive DNA methylation um, is essentially, if you don't, DNA methylation needs to be maintained through cell division. And that's done by DNA, DNMT1, DNA methyltransferase 1. And if you look at the uh, two and four cell embryos up there, you can see DNMT1 is excluded from the nucleus. Um, and so all that's happening there is um, the cells are dividing, and because <clears throat> DNMT1 isn't there to replace the, the methyl marks, um, you're getting a slow diluting out of the, of the methylation through cell division. And that's how the female uh, pronucleus uh, remodels itself. Right, so... DNA methylation is um, critically important for gene silencing. And if <laughs> you can't just erase all your um, uh, DNA methylation without consequences, because there are elements of the genome that absolutely have to be, uh, remain silent. Um, and these are retrotransposons. So what we find with retrotransposons is that they are they don't lose DNA methylation in the pre-implantation embryo, and they don't lose it again in primordial germ cells. So what are retrotransposons? You've probably heard about these as, um, as cut and paste genes. Um, but what they are are ancient viruses that um, integrated into um, uh, the evolutionary line um, many, many thousands of years ago. Um, uh, and once, once they're in there, they are able to copy and paste themselves, meaning they proliferate in our genome. And they now make up uh, more than 50% of the human genome. Uh, and so what happens is you've got a retrotransposon integrant. Uh, it's, it's transcribed by the cell's uh, machinery. And the RNA uh, actually encodes a reverse transcriptase, which comes back and acts on its own RNA to um, reverse transcribe the RNA back into DNA. And this uh, DNA was then able to make the second strand, and then this DNA is then able to insert back into the genome. So if you were to um, completely erase DNA methylation at these marks and allow them to become fully expressed, you can see they would ru run rampant in the genome um, more than they already have. So this is why they need to be protected from epigenetic reprogramming. Um, and as, as it is, we... Sorry. As it is, we get about one germline mutation per human generation. But if they were to, were to be reprogrammed and become expressed um, the way up the rest of the genome is, this would be uh, a lot more striking. Okay. And then there's a third, uh, third type of uh, genes. So they're the genes that become reprogrammed. There are the repeats that don't. And then there are imprinted genes. 
So imprinted genes, uh, they are in black here. They survived the first uh, wave of reprogramming in the um, uh, pre-implantation embryo, but then are, um, uh, do not survive reprogramming in the germ cells. Okay, so what are, what are imprinted genes? Uh, so what it is is a, um, a system of monoallelic expression. Uh, uh, so this is monoallelic expression shown here. You get uh, one set of chromosomes from your, your mum and one set from your dad. Uh, but in imprinted genes, you only see expression from one, one or the other. So, um, uh, and this is in a uh, par parent of origin specific um, uh, manner. So if you receive, in this case, the gene from your dad, uh, you'll, it'll only be active on the paternal chromosome and silent on the maternal chromosome. Okay, so because this is a DNA methylation talk, um, this is controlled by uh, DNA methylation. So what you see is uh, differential methylation between the chromosomes, so shown by these dots here. So in this case, the paternal chromosome is unmethylated, uh, maternal chromosome is methylated, and we're getting expression from the paternal allele only, and the maternal is uh, fully silenced. And there are about 150 of these genes, and they reside in clusters, um, uh, usually. OK, so uh, why do we have imprinted genes? Um, well, we don't know exactly, but we, we uh, explain it by the um, parental conflict theory. Um, it turns out that paternally expressed genes are uh, growth-promoting genes, and maternally expressed genes are growth-limiting genes. And so essentially imprinted genes are, um, are a meth message from the father to tell the babies to grow big and strong and to use all the maternal resources available because that represents the best reproductive strategy for a male. Whereas the message coming from the mum is to um, grow well but leave some resources for me and my future babies. So this is why it's the parental conflict um, in with... Uh, uh, paternal genes telling the babies to grow big and strong and the maternal ones telling them to just take what they need and leave, leave something for the next generations. Okay, so how do you get a message from the parents via their, um, via their chromosomes and into the baby? Uh, and the answer is to that is uh, obviously through the gametes. So what we have is a differential methylation set up in the germ cells. So uh, here's an unmethylated gene there and a methylated gene in the, in the oocyte. And you've got the reciprocal in the, in the um, sperm. And so when these two come, to, uh, come together to, fertilize, to make the fertilized egg, uh, we now have differential methylation, uh, which leads to differential expression of the imprinted genes in the zygote. Um, and obviously, this system would be completely pointless if the methylation was erased in the pre-implantation zygote. So it's not. These imprinted genes escape meth uh, uh, epigenetic erasure and are then maintained through the mid-gestation em embryo and actually all the way through, um, through life of the adult. Um, but you've now got a male or female embryo here uh, that needs to uh, set down the marks of, of its own sex. So what it does uh, in the germ cells now, now they, uh, the imprinted genes, they have to be erased. So they no longer are escaping um, uh, erasure of methylation. Um, they lose their epigenetic marks and then uh, they are re-established as the, as the appropriate mark for their, for their germ cell. So that's why, that's why this trend uh, is necessary. That's why we, uh, they can't escape. Uh, imprinted genes must um, escape uh, erasure of uh, the epigenome genome through pre-implantation embryo, but become erased in the germ cells. Okay. Um, so just really briefly, how do, how do um, regions escape epigenetic re reprogramming. Um, there are actually uh, lots of different ways this happens, but it turns out it's uh, maternal effect genes again. Um, so I showed you that the um, maternal pronucleus uh, survives um, active DNA methyl demethylation, 
And the reason the way this happens is because the um, oocyte comes preloaded with this protein called Stella. Stella binds DNA methylation and blocks, um, blocks uh, TET-mediated demethylation. If you don't have Stella binding the DNA, me the DNA methylation, you get um, uh, erasure of the, of the DNA methylation. Um, and then imprinted genes works fairly similarly. They have a protein similar to Stella, but this time it's trim 28, and it does essentially the same thing at imprinted genes. Um, yeah. Okay, so this slide is a summary of the first part. Um, what I want you to take away from the first bit is that there's uh, two waves of epigenetic reprogramming. One that happens in the pre-implantation embryo and one that happens in the primordial germ cells. Um, and retrotransposons escape both waves of reprogramming, whereas imprinted genes uh, escape the first wave, but, but not the second wave. And I've, this um, slide's a little bit out of place, but I just wanted to put one slide in to say that this isn't a, male spe uh, a, a mammalian specific um, phenomenon. There are all kinds of epigenetic reprogramming that occurs um, throughout life. So when a um, somatic cell of a, of a, of a flower uh, becomes a gametophyte, that has to be reprogrammed uh, in, in much the same way. Uh, when a worker bee eats the royal honey and uh, becomes a, a queen, um, there's a repro the, the genome of the worker needs to be reprogrammed to establish the genome of, of, the, of the queen. Uh, when an axolotl loses a limb, um, wherever that limb gets cut off, the cells, the somatic cells around the, the cut site uh, will completely reprogram into pluripotent cells, um, allowing them to then redifferentiate into the limb. And a lot of lizards, uh, they will actually choose their sex based on uh, the temperature. So if it's hot, the egg will become male, and if it's cold, the egg will become female. Um, and this guy made the cover of Nature a couple of years ago because uh, in Australia, the Australian bearded dragons are losing their females of the population um, due to climate change. So there's all kinds of um, important reasons to study uh, reprogramming. Okay. So can complications in uh, reprogramming affect health? It's really hard to study um, human health, um, specifically diet, and um, specifically as a, um, when, when you're looking at something that has to be studied in, vi in vivo of a developing organism. There are very few um, human studies. But one, uh, one good thing that came out of World War II was um, a, a birth cohort study of the Dutch famine. So um, the Dutch famine was a um, uh, happened in the winter of 1944 um, when the uh, Nazi Germany was blockading food supplies into the Western Netherlands. Um, this was also a really harsh winter, so food um, crops uh, were really low. Um, the famine ended in the in uh, at the end of winter in 1945 uh, with uh, liberation by the Canadians. Um, but during this time, during that winter, the Dutch survived on Allied bread, drop, bed, bread drops which is, that's that there. Um, and so their calorie intake, a typical human calorie intake, should be about 2,000. But for that winter, they dropped to about 500 calories per adult per, per day during this winter. Um, and then after the war, uh, they, 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 they did quite a lot of studies on um, the people who lived during this war, uh, during this famine. And um, one of the interesting ones from an epigenetic point of view was to look at the um, children born during that time. And what they found is that um, if the mother was exposed to the famine during the first trimester of, um, of the, uh, during the first trimester of pregnancy, then the babies were born um, with a predisposition to metabolic disorders. And they saw a, a, a rise in diabetes, ob obesity, and cardiovascular disease. The interesting thing was if the mother was uh, exposed to the famine in the th second or third trimesters, there was no such effect on the offspring. Um, and this effect was seen through two generations. So children born to mothers who survived the famine also gave birth to children who suffered from obesity, cardiovascular disease, and, and diabetes. So why did this happen? The um, answer is uh, DNA methylation. They found altered DNA methylation at metabolic genes of the F1 and F2 um, generations following the, following the Dutch famine. 
Uh, and why did it occur in the first trimester only and not the second and third trimester? And the reason for that is because epigenetic reprogramming occurs in the first trimester. So if, if the famine occurred during reprogramming, you would get the effect. But once the epigenome was reprogrammed and was beginning to be reestablished again, um, there was no such effect of diet on, on, um, on the epigenome. And then finally, why did it last two generations? That's because um, uh, the first trimester mother, actually, uh, there's uh, three generations living in the same body at that point. So you've got the mother, you've got the embryo, and you've got the primordial germ cells. And in the first trimester, the uh, embryo is obviously reprogramming its epigenome, but also in the first trimester, the germs, primordial germ cells are reprogramming their epigenome as well. So because the Dutch famine in the first trimester manages to, to hit two generations and um, affected uh, reprogramming in a similar way um, to both types of reprogramming. Okay, so I just put this one in one more time just to show that there, these, these periods of reprogramming are, are highly sensitive um, periods for, for epigenetics and for the life of an organism. Um, and oh, the environment can affect uh, these processes quite profoundly. Okay, so that's uh, the environment of affecting uh, reprogramming of the epigenome, but um, I just put this in as an example of a disease that's caused by uh, inefficient epigenetic reprogramming. Uh, there are quite a few of these, but... Um, uh, this one occurs at, at my favorite locus, the IGF-2 and H19 locus. Um, the disease is called Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. Um, and there are a couple of different ways to do it, but in a, in a, in a wild type, uh, a healthy human, this is what the locus looks like. The um, maternal allele should have a silent copy of IGF-2 and an active copy of um, H19. And this is uh, because it lacks DNA methylation at its um, control region here. Whereas the paternal genome is methylated here and has the inverse expression pattern with expression of IGF-2, um, silencing of H19. So IGF-2 is a uh, growth-promoting gene, like you'd expect, because it's paternally expressed. Um, H19 is a uh, growth-limiting gene, um, being maternally expressed. Um, but if you have uh, Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, what you get is the maternal allele behaving like the paternal allele. So in this case, um, you've, you gain DNA methylation on the maternal allele, lose expression of H19, and gain expression of IGF-2. So these patients have, have gone from, or well, a healthy individual have, have one dose of expression from each of these two genes, but a Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome patient will have no H19 and a double dose of IGF-2. Um, and what you get is this fetal overgrowth um, phenotype. So I'm showing this guy um, here, he's got it. Um, he looks quite cute, but it can be actually really, um, some of the photos are, are not pleasant, so I chose that one. So it's really quite a debilitating um, disease. And it's caused by uh, inefficient, uh, well, it's caused by a few things. You can get a mutation in this region that leads to um, inappropriate DNA methylation. Uh, you can get a uniparental disomy, or you can get a failure to reprogram the locus. So three ways to cause the disease. Okay, I just wanted to finish up um, going back to Yamanaka's IPS cells because um, yeah, I think they, they, well, because they're interesting. <laughs> um, so these were the transcription factor induced reprogramming. So Yamanaka puts the four transcription factors into fibroblasts and um, is able to make a pluripotent stem cell. Um, and the reason these are so interesting is because of the um, uh, benefits for medicine. So the idea would be that you can take a patient, so, um, so someone who has some kind of disease, you can take a, uh, a cell from their body, it could be a skin cell, it could be a blood cell, any uh, easy to collect cell. You add the four transcription factors, they reprogram their epigenome back into an IP to a pluripotent iPS cell. And what you can do from there is to re-differentiate into the particular cell type that you need. And then the idea sometime in the future is you use these for regenerative, regenerative medicine where 
<clears throat> you just regrow the patient's own organ. So this bypasses all the trouble of having to um, having donor um, uh, what is it called rejecting rejecting do donor organs. You can regrow your own organs, um, and because you can do this, you're doing this in a dish. If you have a mutation or a disease causing mutation, you can correct the mutation in the iPS cell. Uh, before reprogramming it and putting it back into a patient. Uh, the other thing you can do is, uh, for, um, uh, for research purposes, is to take the iPS cell um, from a patient, uh, differentiate it into the um, relevant tissue type for that disease, and then you then have a perfect in vitro system to, in which to study the disease. So you can then use the um, cell type to um, correct the genetic disorder or to screen for drugs or to study the more basic mechanisms of the disease. So epigenetic reprogram has really gone from being um, the work of academics into um, what really promises to um, uh, transform um, the future of medicine. So understanding how this epigenetic reprogramming works is really key to being able to harness this system. Because at the moment, there are a couple of stumbling blocks Points, but one of the main ones is we can't get epigenetic reprogramming perfectly right because we can't, don't completely understand how it happens. We can make it happen well enough to, uh, uh, for a mouse, but not well enough for a human yet. So um, this is really a key point for the future. And that's where I'll stop. So thank you. Um, I was curious about how the specificity of the reprogramming is controlled, like, for example, with the 150 or so imprinted genes, like, how does something like Trim specifically know to specific manipulation of those? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows, no. Or, like, retrotransposons? Like, how yep, no one knows. Them? No. No, no, no one knows how, the, uh, how, how it's chosen. It's, pro it's probably got something to do with um, histone marks, I'd imagine. There's the, it, it'll be something to do with the environment around um, those particular genes. So histone marks are quite different at retrotransposons compared to um, gene regions, and they're also quite different around um, imprinted genes as well. Um, but uh, they call it the histone code. You don't just have one histone mark. You have a combination of multiple histone marks that come together to make a code of how the whole thing works. So and teasing apart exactly what that code is at particular regions is very difficult. And yeah, at the moment we have no idea <laughs> how they're protected. And is that, sorry, is that histone code um, ultimately determined by the gene sequence? Uh, no, 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 no. The hist. Um, no, I guess we don't really know um, <laughs> how, how, how the histone code's la um, laid out either. But, um, yeah, so uh, the epigenetic mark genetic marks are mitotically heritable. So something is established early, and then they're able to re faithfully um, be reproduced in the, in the daughter cells. What means, what makes that ha able to happen um, at repeats and not um, genes is, is up for grabs. Don't know. Uh, so do we know if the differential demethylation of the maternal and paternal from the heavenly to the maternal and paternal family are totally different? Um, that you mean in the in the one cell embryo? Yes. Um, no. No, it doesn't have anything to do with imprinting. The imprinting all happens in the germ cells, um, and the uh, imprints in the embryo are completely ignored. Yeah. Um, sorry if I missed this, but the 150 imprinting genes, are they just genes that are required for the survival during that phase, or what do those genes do? Uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't say that, and that's um, that's... True, they're mostly, almost, almost entirely um, uh, genes required for development of the embryo. So the idea of imprinting is that it's um, a way of regulating maternal resources. So like you'd imagine um, 
certainly relevant when you're an embryo, when, when you're a baby in, inside the mother. Um, but there are imprinted genes that continue um, on um, uh, post-birth. And what they think they are, so they don't go for very long post-birth, um, but what they think they are is uh, genes that um, modify the behavior of the embryo. And uh, if the, oh, sorry, of the baby. <laughs> if the, so, if the, so the way the baby behaves um, has an effect on how it gains resources from the mother as well. So even post-birth, how, um, how it suckles and that sort of thing. So, so there are imprinted genes that go slightly beyond birth for that reason. Um, there are also a lot of imprinted genes in the placenta because that's obviously the, well, the whole point of the placenta is allocating maternal resources. And then the last place we find them is in the brain. Um, and uh, that's because the brain is weird. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, imprinted genes uh, are prevalent in the brain. There are a whole lot of genes that are imprinted in the brain but not imprinted in other tissues. Likewise, there are a lot of repeats get expressed in the brain as well, and we don't really know why these two things happen, but each brain cell needs to be slightly different to another brain cell, and the brain seems to have just adopted all these mechanisms for creating diversity in the brain, and we don't know an awful lot about it, but, yep, they've co-opted repeats and imprinted genes. Um, do we know if any of these sort of long-term protections occur in cancer, so these, the, the protein which binds to the methylation to protect it from being demethylated, are, are these sorts of things being re-exerted in a cancer phenotype to prevent tumor suppressors from being turned on and being passed on to their daughter cells? Yeah, huh, good question, and I don't know. I think it's probably a really good idea, but yeah, I know I couldn't tell you if people were looking into that. I'll, I'll have a look and get back to you, that's a good suggestion. In the Dutch famine, that's a fairly old study perhaps, so, but is there anything, anything known about which of the 150 genes were involved there? Were they renewal genes? Or... Uh, so, uh, um... There was a couple of genes. Um, one of them was IGF-2, which I showed you in the imprinting example, and the other one was a gene upstream from IGF-2, um, CDK and 1C. Uh, so that, that they uh, no, there was so, so particularly at the, their imprinting control regions. So when I show you those pictures and I showed you the DNA methylation, so those there's actually DNA methylation all over the place, but there are specific regions that are critical to imprinting, and so those two had um, uh, mo modifications at their imprinting control region, the critical bit. There was also DNA methylation changes all over. Um, at, at metabolic genes, yeah. but there's so the the difference is the difference for, at metabolic genes is largely um, what do I want to say? <laughs> uh, it, it's expression driven. So if you've got um, something dry, something driving the disease, there'll be all these downstream um, methylation changes that occur um, just because there's been a change in expression. But the driving mutations were, will occur at the at the control regions. Uh -huh. so yeah, TET 1 and 2 uh, work uh, later in development. TET 3 is the one that does it in the OSI. So for um, reprogramming, TET3 is the interesting one, but it's only expressed in the other side. Okay, so that's why it gets the cancer in TET1. That's right, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, cancer is um, sort of, um, well, one of, the, one of the features is a, is a loss of DNA methylation. So you get um, these hyperactive TET en enzymes, you get essentially a reprogramming of, programming of the cancer cell, and you get sort of wild expression of genes that should be silenced. Overgrowth, you know, proportional overgrowth, or how, how much overgrowth? 
Because it wasn't clear for your photo. Yeah, no, I showed um, not, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's a real spectrum, um, and I couldn't, I'm not sure why it's a spectrum, but um, yeah, it can be um, quite sort of devastating.